Good morning. Let me wish you a happy 4th of July weekend. I hope you're doing well. I suppose maybe sometime this weekend or in the next few days, you're going to eat a hot dog and I uh, hope you survive that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, we, on the other hand, are headed to Canada. Um, this afternoon, Sunday afternoon, we will head to D.C. and spend the night at our son's house and then leave tomorrow for two weeks in Canada. So I will be gone the next two weeks. Uh, we're going to spend a week in Saskatoon. Uh, I'm going to get to see my sister and some other family members and longtime friends of ours. And then we're going to go to British Columbia and spend a week at the lake house of our friends and um, just relax and, and enjoy ourselves with them. And um, we're very much looking forward to it. Um, I think it's it's very good rest is a good thing is what I'm trying to say. Um, in the book of Hebrews, Jesus, God talks about his rest and entering his rest. That's what he calls it. So I, I do believe there, there are times in our life and for us, it's now we're going to rest and hopefully be rejuvenated and uh, come back with with a renewed zeal and energy, um, ready for whatever God has in mind for the next year. I think it's going to be good stuff. Um, I think God is good and has blessed us in many ways. I look forward to seeing what it is he's going to do. So I want to get good and rested up for that. Uh Anyway, uh, let me lead us in a prayer, and we will begin this service. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the blessings that you, you pour upon us. We're thankful, Father, for this country and for all the, the many blessings that we enjoy here, one of which is the freedom to assemble and to, to meet and to worship, and, and we're thankful for that freedom, Father. We, we really are. We are thankful, Father, for the even greater blessings that come through your kingdom. Our salvation, our hope, our trust in you, our faith, the love that we have for each other because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And here and later on today, Father, we're going to meet around the table and remember what Jesus Christ did on our behalf. We look forward to that, Father. Be with us, Lord, as we worship together. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. December 7th, 1941. That morning at around 6.37 a.m., the destroyer Ward sank a midget submarine in the mouth of Pearl Harbor. As, as this submarine was spotted, it was obvious this is not our submarine. And so as they approached, they fired upon it and ended up sinking and destroying it. And when they got to the spot where that submarine had been, they dropped depth charges and saw an oil slick, which they knew means that submarine had been destroyed. Now, this was a warning sign of what was coming, but they really didn't realize it. Later that morning, I mean, 20, 25 minutes later, it, it, at one of the four mobile radar stations that had been set up on the Hawaiian Islands, at just past 7 a.m., the, the men that were manning that radar station noticed this huge white blob on the radar screen. And they assumed that it must be faulty equipment. So they went out and checked everything that they could check, but they couldn't find anything wrong. So they finally called into headquarters to let them know. And, and yet the operator told them, sorry, everybody is at breakfast. You'll just have to wait till they call you back. So they waited for a call back. And finally, when they did get the call back, they were, they were told 
we don't worry about it. It's probably just the B-17s that are coming in from San Francisco. These are American B-17s. Nothing to worry about. So neither the sinking of the sub or the blob on the radar screen caused enough of a response for them to at least be somewhat prepared for what is about to happen. At 7.48 a.m. on a quiet Sunday morning, less than an hour from sinking of the sub and 45 minutes from seeing a large blob on the radar, 353 aircraft in two waves launched from six carriers stationed 200 miles north of Honolulu attacked Pearl Harbor. They used radio transmissions from local Hawaiian radio stations to guide them in. All eight battleships were damaged and four of them were sunk. Eleven other Navy boats were sunk or damaged. 188 aircraft destroyed and 159 damaged. 2,403 Americans were killed and 1,178 were wounded. The only bright spot really was that our aircraft carriers were out on maneuvers and were not in the harbor, and so they were spared. Now, the question should arise, and I don't want to uh, oversimplify this or be disrespectful in any way, but why were we so unprepared? And that's a, that's a more complicated answer than I'm going to try to give here. But I'm going to tell you one of the big reasons we were so unprepared is we were focused on the wrong enemy. Now, we knew the Japanese. We knew we, that, that, that tensions between an us and, and the nation of Japan were, were definitely headed towards war. And, and so it's not like we didn't consider them an enemy. But that's not really who we focused on, particularly on the islands of Hawaii. They considered the residents of Japanese descent, which was about one-third of Hawaii's population, a greater risk than the army of Japan 4,000 miles away. So, they, so they, they were more worried about sabotage from residents than an army that seemed to be so far away that we didn't really need to worry about them. And so one of the things they did, they lined up their battleships. They also lined up their aircraft in, in tight formation on the ground and, and in the harbor so that they could guard better from sabotage. They would be easier to protect if, if, if locals decided to sabotage them. So that's what they were focused on so that when the Japanese came, I mean, it was just sitting ducks. Everything was lined up for them. Focusing on the wrong enemy can be catastrophic, which our country found out that morning. You should be able to make the jump to the parallel to what Christians face. What is the enemy that we should be focused on? What should we be concerned about? I believe in Mark chapter 9, Jesus is working on this with his disciples. Okay? With the disciples, what is the objective? Okay, if you were to ask any of them, what's the objective? And what, are, what are we trying to do? I think in the disciples' opinion... It's to realize the, the position of Messiah, okay, and gain the rewards that come with that, okay? So, yes, Jesus is not the powerful Messiah who is in power and able to affect change and bring great rewards, okay? But that's kind of, in their minds at least, that's where we're headed. Now, if you were to ask Jesus, ask his opinion, he would say, to bring salvation to all humanity. These are two radically different objectives. They are aiming at two completely different targets. And Jesus will need to bring them around to his objective. 
And as we have been witnessing in the book of Mark, this is not easy or quick. So let's look in Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 38. Teacher said, John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name and told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Truly I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. So John, John comes along and says, we have found someone trying to get on in on the rewards that are ours. You know, Joshua kind of said the same thing to Moses one time. Um, in, in Numbers chapter 11, we have this story where Eldad and Medad are, are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, uh, it, it, Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' aide since youth, spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. But Moses replied, are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and the Lord would put his spirit on them. That is, a, that is very similar in thinking uh, as to what we see in Mark chapter 9. You know, uh, later, these same uh, James and John who were called the sons of thunder, okay? They would, they're later, they're, one of their uh, suggestions to Jesus basically is to nuke a village, okay? Uh, a, a, there was a Samaritan village, we read it about it in Luke chapter 9, that didn't welcome Jesus, and, and they were greatly offended. And, and says, when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? And so what what I'm saying is that, that again you can easily see the difference that that it, and, and in the way of thinking and that it brings with it a completely different way of viewing the world and its circumstances. So the disciples of Jesus see the world one way and Jesus sees it another way. And Jesus is going to have to help them adjust that to where they can see things his way. And so Jesus talks with them about uh, the, the name, his name, using his name against evil. When you are in the very tough business of saving the world, you see things differently. Jesus knows that there will come a time when no one will give these men even a drink of, uh, uh, of cold water. In fact, they will be martyred. Okay? And so I think Jesus could say to them, maybe you envision a grand future in this society that will remind you of David and Solomon but that is not reality. And I think in their minds, that's what they're shooting for. And that's what they want. What Jesus is saying, where he, he keeps explaining to them, I'm going to be arrested. Uh, you know, I'm going to be killed, uh, but I will rise again. That, that doesn't fit, but that's the truth. Okay. Whether they understand it or not. When you have an almost impossible job, you look for friends where you can find them. And that's what Jesus is doing. And he's telling his disciples, don't quit, quit being so, you know, exclusive, trying to, to have things exactly your, you don't understand. The teachers of the law who did not use the name of Jesus to cast out Satan in any way, criticized Jesus and said he drives out demons by the power of Beelzebub. Now, they have no idea what they're talking about because that's not their business. Driving out demons or counteracting the work of Satan is not their business. Even though you would think it would be their business, it's not. But people that are in the real business of fighting save Satan 
will not do that. That's what Jesus is saying. When you are really in the business of fighting Satan as he is, you will, we will recognize each other. And we will, in humility, support each other, not attack each other. You know, as an aside here, when your children become old enough, you realize making varsity, being first clair clarinet, first chair clarinet, getting good grades, having a date for the prom, etc., are not the real challenges. Guiding them through the tough process of their faith becoming their own, that's the real battle. And you find yourself in the battle for their faith, and you look for allies everywhere. And there are often years where they won't listen to you anymore, so you hope there are people who will speak the same words of God. And you will find it yourself adopting a much more humble stance with new priorities. I think that is similar to what Jesus is talking about here. You know, in the world where we live, some will convince you or try to convince you that the enemy we face is socialism or Marxism or communism or liberalism or conservatism. But it's not. Those may or may not be enemies of our 401ks, okay? But 401ks are not our target. The enemy is Satan. And the destruction of people in his wake, it's not economics. It's people. And that's who Satan is destroying you know, right in our own midst, Satan is using the internet that we invented to destroy children and men particularly. It is a great source of evil used by Satan. Satan is also using human trafficking. And I'm just mentioning a couple. Human trafficking, which is the, the scourge of the earth. It is, it is just openly evil and destructive of people. It is so evil and so destructive, I will not describe it, okay? So don't worry. In this sermon online or in the sermon in person, I am not going to describe it because it is too graphic and too evil. But it enslaves and exploits 30 million adults and 10 million children and is a $150 billion industry. As a, uh, I can't remember what, as, as a, a bad industry, evil industry, it's second only to drug trafficking, which is somewhere between $460 billion and $650 billion. That's, that's just, the money is incredible, but it's not the money. It's the people. It's the, the destruction that Satan is using these industries to destroy people. That's the enemy that we face. At the same time, I, I, I think we, we need to stop and think about what the media is telling us to focus on. Okay? Library books, history, Christmas, recycling. These are things that the media is telling us, this is the great enemy. This is what we must face down. This is what we must fight. And this is what, what gets us all concerned. And, and I, I'm telling you, it, it, it's just like the, the, the those in charge, uh, you know, in 1941 on Oahu Island, you're, you're looking at the wrong thing. You're focused on the wrong thing. And it causes you to not be ready. And, and you know, I mentioned library books and history and Christmas and recycling. But the truth is, let, let's don't argue about these things and which make the most sense. Let's, let's don't do that. Instead, let's stop and ask ourselves what God cares about. Let's keep reading. 
Verse 42, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the worms, worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. I'm not going to go into a, a deep analysis of that verse because I'm asking this. This is the question I'm asking. What does God care about? What is the target that God is looking at? What is it that would concern him? I'm telling you, it's children. God cares about children, and he says it straight up. He's not ashamed to say, if you hurt children, I'm going to hurt you. God cares about this. The stuff I was saying earlier about the Internet and about human trafficking and, and drug trafficking, God cares about that stuff. It has nothing to do with the economics of it. It has to do with the destructive power of it. And that's what God cares about. And God also cares about people coming to him for eternity. God's like, like God's saying, like, who cares about your hand? Who cares about your foot? Who cares about your eye? Just get here. Come, come to me. Open yourselves to me. Give yourselves to me. Whatever it takes, whatever it costs, it doesn't matter. The cost doesn't matter. Because this is not about cost. This is about life. Come to me for life. And that's what he was talking about children. That's what he's talking about adults. And then he also talks about how we treat each other. That's what matters to him. And you can see it throughout scripture, how much God cares about how we treat each other. As, as we look at this passage of scripture, Jesus is not saying nothing matters. That's not at all what he's saying. But I really believe what he is saying to his apostles and what he is saying to us is these things don't matter. So many of the things that we are so worried about and so focused on and get so upset about, those things to God relatively don't matter. But Jesus is going to give his life for what does matter. This is what I mean. He didn't say nothing matters. You just look at the life, the death of Jesus Christ. Things matter to him a lot, but it's people. People is what matters to God. People of all races, all ages, all social standing, economic position, educational levels, intelligence, and personality. That's what he cares deeply about. You know, and they won't all think like Jesus or believe everything that he does. They won't all know their Bibles or go to church. But Jesus died for them, in fact. Therefore, I need to change the target at which I am aiming. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we want to have the same objectives in our heart that are in your heart. We want to be looking at the same target that you're looking at, the things that break your heart, the things that disturb you, the things that concern you, the enemy. May we always remember exactly who the enemy is. The enemy is Satan and all of his evil forces. And the destruction that he is bringing on people in this world should break our hearts. It does break our hearts, Father. And we can see it showing up in so many different ways and so many different perversions of what's good. And we absolutely can see people that have become addicted to what is destructive to them. And that breaks our heart, Father. 
May we be in step with you and in line, in line with you so that you're not having to spend your time correcting us, but instead you can spend your time using us. That's what we want, Father. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You step down into darkness Open my eyes, let me see Beauty that made this heart adore you Hope of a life spent with you And here I am to worship Here I am to bow down here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days, oh so highly exalted, Glorious in heaven above Humbly you came to the earth you created All for love's sake became poor And here I am to worship Here I am to bow down Here I am to say that you're my God you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Good morning, everybody. So this morning, I want to talk about the kingdom of God. This is something that I've thought about a lot been trying to understand, you know, just what the kingdom of God is uh, and what it looks like. And this story that I'm going to read from Mark chapter 10 has been instrumental in helping me understand, I think, what the kingdom of God is really all about. So starting in verse 35 of chapter 10 says, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. So what is it that James John want? They want uh, victory the same way the world wants victory. They see a kingdom where the Messiah rises up. He crushes the pagan enemies of Israel and he throws off the yoke of Rome. Then when he's enthroned and brought into his glory in their vision of this, uh, they want to be right there beside him. And then Jesus, in typical Jesus fashion, says this to him. He says, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? We can, they answered. And he said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. But to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. Those places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. You know, it's pretty blunt. You guys have no idea what you're asking for. If you did, you wouldn't be asking. And we see, you know, just what did it mean? What did he mean when he said the places to whom they've been prepared for at his right and left? So Luke chapter 23, 32 says, And two other criminals were also led away to be executed with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, the one on his right and the other on his left. So here was the enthronement and the glorification of God. And who was that his right and left? Two criminals, two rebels, probably rebels against Rome. But this was actually victory. This was true victory. This was the victory that the prophets had been talking about for hundreds of years in Israel, but it didn't look like it to them. Frankly, this is the inauguration of the kingdom. This is the return of Yahweh to Zion. 
you know, and what, you know, I asked earlier as I was thinking about it, what does the kingdom look like? And so this is what it looks like. It looks like an act of sacrificial love, you know, love for people that don't deserve it. And I'm certainly one of those. I definitely do not deserve this act of love, you know, from the creator and sustainer of life of all things, you know, and when we think about what the world might expect from a kingdom, certainly what, you know, James and John expected from it, you would think of uh, a kingdom inaugurated with chariots and swords, or, you know, modern day, you'd think of tanks and assault rifles. That's how you bring about a kingdom in this world. But Jesus says, no way, man. My kingdom was born from a love so profound that it actually defeats death. Jesus takes on the evil of the world, all the aggression and desire for power and fame, and he takes it on himself and he actually dies with it. You know, he could easily have raised an army. There were plenty of people who wanted to fight Rome in those days. So he could have fought them, you know, actually went to war as a lot of uh, wannabe messiahs did back in those days. Or he could have ran and hid in the desert, you know, with his disciples, sort of like the community that created the Dead Sea Scrolls and Qumran. But he didn't because that wouldn't have been the kind of kingdom that he was after. That wouldn't have been a kingdom of God. That would have been a kingdom of man. And so as we think about it, like in this light, for me, uh, this poem in Isaiah 52 really takes on new meaning. And it's, it's just beautiful, I think. Because how delightful on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace, who brings good news, who announces salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns as king. The voices of your watchmen, they lift up their voices. Together they sing for joy. For they clearly see Yahweh's return to Zion. Break forth, sing for joy together, ruins of Jerusalem. For Yahweh has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. So I think we do that here at this table. Uh, we celebrate. We, though we don't really sing, it's definitely enjoy this act that was, you know, consummated in a broken body and, and shed blood is actually uh, the act of the kingdom of God. It's the beginning. It's done in love. Not at all what you would expect. Not at all what the world would expect. And so I think that leaves us with well, in some way, we have to respond. You know, we can't just leave it at this. We can't celebrate and walk away and, you know, not take something from this. And so I think I'll leave us with this quote from N.T. Wright um, about how we move forward with this. He says, the message that you and I have to grasp today is that we are called to be followers, disciples of the servant king, so that the victory of the cross may be implemented in the world. Disciples means not just head learners, not just heart learners, but life learners. We have to discover through prayer, study of the scriptures, and above all devotion to Jesus himself, such as we express when we come to his table, how we in our generation can implement the decisive victory which he won. So let's pray now for the bread and the cup. Gracious Heavenly Father, Thank you for this victory. Thank you for bringing about a kingdom that nobody expected, but that everybody needed. Uh, a kingdom of love and, and consummated in a sacrificial act where Jesus took all this on himself and he was, his body was broken and his blood was shed. And yet this was victory. This was the defeat of death. Lord, we just, words can't even express our thankfulness for this. We ask now that as we, we take this bread and this cup that you would anoint us with your spirit to not only celebrate this victory now, but take this victory out into the world and show who the true king is. Everybody may not see who the king is just yet, but in time we will, Father, we pray that we might be uh, instrumental in helping people see who the king is, who the kings of our lives are, and that the servant king really does reign. 
Lord, we just thank you for all this. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks again for attending our online worship service here today at the Waynesburg Church of Christ. We hope that if you're ever in the area of Waynesburg, Virginia, that you'll stop by and see us. We're located on Brookerdale Road. It's real easy to find. I just have a couple of brief announcements, and then we'll uh, end our service with closing prayer. Just remember that our teens, uh, many of our teens will be going to church camp here in the next week or so. So we'd like to thank Alfred and TJ for taking them and many others. So be praying for them as well. Also, we want to make sure that you include in your schedule July 30th. That is our family day uh, service here in Waynesboro. Afterwards, we'll have a meal. And uh, if you haven't heard, Mark and Dana Frazier are going to be moving to North Carolina. And we're going to honor them that day, July 30th, right after worship with a fellowship meal together. So make sure you plan on coming to attend that. In addition, we've just come up with a new Waynesboro Church of Christ app. So if you have a smartphone, we encourage you to go to your app store and type in Waynesboro Church of Christ, and you'll see the app pop up. Download it on your phone, and you can keep up to date with everything that's going on here at the church. You can view sermons. You can see everything, and uh, it's uh, better than a website. So check it out, and uh, we hope you have a rest of their awesome day and a rest of a great week. Uh, let's all close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this uh, day that you've given us, Father, uh, blessing us here right at the 1st of July. I want to thank you for the recent rain we received. We pray that uh, all of us will have a good summer. We know that many are traveling. Uh, our teens are going to camp pretty soon. We pray that you'll be with them as they travel. And we pray, Father, that you'll be with our elderly. We have several that are in nursing homes, several have been in the hospital. Uh, just continually look after the doctors and nurses as they take care of them. Again, thank you for loving us. Thank you for blessing us. And be with us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.